Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. I'm at ScottHorton.org, APSRadioNews.com, DailyPaulRadio.com, AnomalyRadio.com. I'm on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show, and on and on and on like that. you got to Google, man. Look it up if you want. All right. Uh, this is my show, Scott Horton Show. Our first guest today is Daniel McAdams. For years and years, he was foreign policy advisor to Dr. Ron Paul in the House of Representatives, and now he is the head of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity at ronpaulinstitute.org. Welcome back to the show, Dan. How are you doing? Thanks, Scott. It's great to be with you again. Uh, good. It's very good to uh, have you back on the show here. And, uh, you know, in the midst of all this Ukraine crisis, I sure do like uh, reading your stuff. Uh, you obviously already knew a lot about Ukraine uh, going back. I don't know if you knew a lot before the last time America did a coup d'etat in Kiev, uh, but you've certainly learned a lot. Maybe you can tell us about your background knowledge of this uh, of this kind of thing, um, and then uh, maybe steer us toward, um, well, I don't know. I, I, we don't want to do a whole summary here. I want to, I want to skip. Hey, tell us any, any background, anything interesting about your background in this uh, subject matter, and then we'll skip ahead to uh, what's going on here with the attack on the building in Odessa the other day. Sure. Well, actually, I, um, I spent most of the 90s living next door in, uh, in Hungary, so I did, uh, I did a lot of traveling, a lot of election monitoring, didn't actually get into Ukraine, but quite familiar with the very complex historical and uh, ethnic makeup of Ukraine. As you know, a, a tiny tip of, uh, of Ukraine had been in historic Hungary, so you do have a Hungarian minority living there as well. So it's always been a very touchy situation. And also, you know, the whole sort of Soviet succession, uh, succession states has never really completely played itself out. So you did always have a tinderbox there but you know as you as you mentioned i was working for dr paul back in uh 03 and 04 when the uh, orange revolution 1.0 uh took place and uh, you remember we, we even ran some on the on the site some of dr paul's statements at the time mm -hmm. telling the u.s to butt out stop sending all these millions of dollars and doing all this training uh to people over there who are trying to overthrow their government so yeah we've been watching this for a long time and then, so, um, I guess, you know, most listeners to this show, if not, they can go back, catch up. They can go to ronpaulinstitute.org. Uh, they can go back to scotthorton.org, go through the archives and catch up a little bit. But we've basically got, I don't think it's really a right-left thing as much as a east-west thing. And there are clearly, uh, you know, hardcore right-wing nationalists on the western side, uh, which include these groups, Svoboda and Right Sector, who are pretty much outright neo Nazis. I don't know what would distinguish what would distinguish them. The the different kind of SS logo that they brandish <laughs> compared to the, the lightning bolts or something. I don't know. Um so uh and then I don't know if it's really kind of a left wing led thing on the pro Russian side at all or whether they're, you know, pretty much conservatives too, but just with different loyalties or or how exactly that works out. Maybe you can fill us in. But we certainly had a building that was occupied by uh, pro-Russian protesters in Odessa, which was attacked by, uh, according to The Guardian and other sources, right sector. It was a pretty big crowd of people attacked and uh, set the fire there. So I guess it, tell us everything you know about what actually happened there and then uh, how many people were killed and, and all of that. And then we can get into the media cr criticism here, which I think is... Sure. You know, really, it's exceptional what the the degree of dishonesty and and lie by omission here. It's it's really notable in its own right. Not quite as bad as the mass murder itself, but still pretty drastic. Um, but so anyway, so tell us what you know about this protest and and how it turned into this riot. Yeah, I think Odessa is a really interesting uh, situation. It's a terrible tragedy. I don't know that we will know everything that happened. I probably. 
I, I probably by mis- mistakenly I've watched so many minutes and hours of video taken from every angle of everything that happened. And uh, from from what I could see and from what you know other people who who shot the video could tell, there was there had long been an encampment in front of the trade union building, the anti Kiev people, the people who are opposed to the U.S. backed coup in Kiev in February. They sent up sort of a mini tent city there, uh, as they had done on the Maidan, the other side, and had been camping there for a while. And apparently there was a soccer game, a football game that day, and the groups, uh, from, from we could see in the video, came running down the street. They torched the, the tent city. The guys who were occupying it then went into the trade union building. Uh, the, you know, the video looks, it looks pretty wild. Uh, like they were pretty, you know, intent on violence. I think there had been some violence at some point uh, from the from the pro east, you know, the anti Kiev people. So it was a it's sort of a give and take for a while, and then these groups went into the building, and you can this is this is you know the media which we'll talk about in a minute. You can clearly see the people outside, the pro Kiev people, the as you say, the right sector types, the extreme rightists. You can clearly see them throwing Molotov cocktails. Uh, tragically, you can see some some young gals, uh, some young women filling up these Molotov cocktails with gasoline. Uh, so they happen, you know, they have to be considered accessories to murder, really. But you can see these guys throwing them in. And then we've seen some videos lately of the guys, the people who are trying to escape from the window as they were being burned. Uh, they stepped in front of the window and they were shot at by some of these right sector people. So this is, is clearly um, a, 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 an a- act of mass murder against these uh, anti-Kiev people. And as you point out, the way it's been covered in the West is very different from anyone. And these videos are available to anyone to see. You know, it's not like this is not uh, some kind of uh, secret. So, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, in the footage from, I guess, the roof of a building across the street, uh, something like that, you can see that as soon as they arrive, they just completely ransack all of the tents and all of that, and then blam goes the Molotov cocktail, was ready to go, goes soaring through the air, lands right on the front porch of the building there, right at the front door uh, yeah. kind of area there. Uh, so, but what I, you know, what I can, there are many things that I can't figure out, and every, a lot of people are speculating. There are things that, frankly, I just don't know. I don't understand why it seemed like there were pro Kiev people in the building, I don't understand why so many of the victims had been shot in the face. Uh, and I don't understand why so many people were only burned from their neck up. You'll see pictures of them, and it's quite gruesome, but you'll see pictures of them where the, you know, from the neck down, they look completely normal. But from the neck up, they're completely burned. Uh, so there are, there are so many strange things I don't understand. Uh, there are rumors that some sort of noxious gases were used. Uh, to kill these people, then they tried to burn them to cover the evidence. Uh, you saw one gruesome image of uh, supposedly a woman who had been raped before she was burned alive. So it is it is very difficult to see the full picture, but clearly something very strange happened, and you have to wonder, who did the planning behind this? I don't know. Well, I mean, it may not have been that well planned to be planned, but um, then again... Uh, you never really know. Um, well, it's interesting. Maybe, is, you, know, maybe you, saw, you will, but not yet. Yeah. I mean, it's troubling because you do, and I want to get into uh, too much speculation here, but there were, I'm sure you saw the article in the German press over the weekend that the CIA and FBI had sent in dozens of people to advise the government in Kiev on how to put down these insurgencies right. or these uh, protests. You know, there's no evidence that they were directly involved in what happened in Odessa, but you do have to wonder, some of these guys... I mean, the CIA operative guys are not uh, schoolboys, you know. <laughs> they, 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 they're they some pretty tough characters, so who knows? Right, all right. Well, and so then the big question there is, before we get to the whole media thing, which is just a disaster, but uh, it really, you know, more to the point, the, the more important question is, uh, you know, what this symbolizes on the road to some kind of Ukrainian civil war. I mean, it had seemed to me that, the new junta doesn't really have enough power to try to really take over the east they they've made somewhat half-hearted attempts and have been you know mostly foiled and so it seemed like well, you know maybe there's not enough 
for those who would reject their rule to push back against and maybe the the you know the bad spirits here can sort of uh you know wind their way uh down and 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 cooler heads can prevail rather than the thing escalating but it seems like you know the government in Kiev keeps trying to push it and things like this where it's you know dead civilian activists not battles among even quote unquote militants but basically dead activists at the hands of brown shirts this is the kind of thing that makes it much harder for cooler heads to prevail but you know i don't know i don't want to be too bad of a doomsayer you think that maybe it could be negotiated what if what if the americans and the russians really tried you know really wanted to and really tried to hammer this thing out and come to a peaceful agreement you think they could well i think one of the big problems is that the u.s side has been so disingenuous from the beginning you know they've insisted that we know for a fact that the uh, that the Russians are involved in these insert or the, these protests They're, they've been infiltrating them they've given them weapons and they know it for a fact yet every single time they've come forth with a piece of evidence it's been refuted if you remember General Breedlove a while ago came forth and said oh we have this satellite image of all these these tanks and this buildup it turns out it was a couple of years old then they came again and said oh we've got these pictures of these guys uh, you know, the same guys who was in, who were in Georgia and Russia and Ukraine. Well, the guy who took the picture said, that's bogus. That's not true. Right. And, uh, and on and on, uh, you know, several yeah, and in fact, the New York Times had a thing where they really investigated and said, no, these are really all Ukrainians. They may be pro Russian, but they're two of a man. They're Ukrainians. That's exactly, I mean, to their credit, they actually sent someone in there and the right. New York Times is, it's definitely not a pro-Russia paper. Yeah, and, well, you know, Robert Perry called it a sort of retraction because they didn't yeah. really say, we were wrong the other day, but they were definitely contradicting themselves, as you put it, admitting it that, like, yeah, we're, yeah sort of sure, and the, not yeah. quite fast enough. I'm sorry, hold it right there. we got to take this big break, but then we'll be right back with Dan McAdams from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Right after this. Hey, I'll Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first. And just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show here. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Dan McAdams. He's the director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity at ronpaulinstitute.org. This piece is called U.S. Media Covers Up Mass Murder in Odessa, Ukraine. And, uh, again, it's uh, murder at the hands of the right sector uh, brown shirt, Banderas types. Well, it seems, well, like, it seems like, you know, the Americans, well, or the, the Western side, if they've thrown in their lot with the West, I mean, they've got to know how unreliable we are, <laughs> or our governments are, of course. Um, but um, well, it seems know, it's like if, if they can make matters worse, so much the better for them to a point. I mean, if the assumption is that the worst that they could do would be to lose the East to Russia, at least, you know, they would hope that that would solidify their support from the Western side, something. I mean, I don't know, when when that uh, leak of um, uh, the gas princess, Yulia Tymoshenko, was released, and she was saying, yeah, you know, nuke East Ukraine and all of those pro-Russian bastards, whatever, she didn't really mean kill them all, but what she meant was she hated them all, and she was basically, I don't know if, if it, it probably wasn't, I don't know if it was a provocation by her, um, but well, it was, we, you know, basically an escalation. It was a renunciation of any pretended legitimacy that she might have or her party might have to rule them by declaring them basically all outlaws and enemies of the state who, you know, might as well be Russians or whatever. And so she, uh, I, she repeated she repeated that yesterday where she said that. You know, they need, we need to get a militia together. We need to get volunteers together to come out and go out to the east, you know, and basically take care of these people, you know. it's So the government so in Kiev, they're not trying to work this out. They're trying to, you know, prove that they're the state, that they have a monopoly here, and they're going to go and do an anti-terrorist operation. I guess the Americans could make them cool their jets, but the Americans are encouraging them to go ahead and follow through like this. 
but but yet at the same time they claim that the Russians need to de-escalate. Well, as you know, as a New York Times story, the lack of evidence, everything else demonstrates there's really nothing to de-escalate because, believe it or not, the Russians aren't in there. You know, I mean, I can imagine. Putin pulling his hair out, saying, "How many times do we have to tell you?" Right. You know, and, and it, it comes to the point where the U.S. is 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 irritated with Russia for having troops on its own soil. You know, this from a country with troops in what? How many? 120 countries across the world. You know, but what I think well, is, in fact, the AP is reporting right now that that Putin is claiming, at least, which this is pretty verifiable, uh, that his troops, he has called his troops to back off from the Ukraine border. He's trying to de-escalate for his part, at least that much. Exactly. Well, there was a meeting between Putin and the current head of the OSCE, who has to be the, happens to be the president of Switzerland. And basically, three huge steps back uh, on the part of Putin, <clears throat> which I think are going to irritate people who on both sides, because some people think that Putin is going to rush in and save the day. And anyone who studies his behavior in the past knows that that is not how he operates. You know, they're the Putinistas or whatever you want to call them who think who think he's going to do the smackdown. Uh, that's not going to happen. But anyway, what happened today is Putin said the refer- for referendum in Donetsk uh, should be postponed and to allow negotiations to take place. Uh, the presidential election scheduled for later this month might be a good step in the right direction in Ukraine. And as you pointed out, he said, we'll pull back our troops even further. These are three pretty significant climb downs on his part. And what does the State Department spokesman Jen Psaki say? Oh, he's not doing enough to de-escalate. Is this clearly not satisfactory enough? They're not pulling the troops back enough. He hasn't gone far enough. So it's it's just you know they're not they're not allowing diplomacy to take place whatsoever. They're too busy uh, doing selfies and putting up hashtags on Twitter to actually sit down like adults and try to talk this out. Right. Well. And, you know, uh, of course, the the other headline is that how many 30, more than 30 terrorists killed in fighting yesterday and uh, four Ukrainian soldiers. And so, I mean, they really keep escalating this uh, from the American side uh, before, you know, just the other day. It was five killed at a checkpoint somewhere by some right sector guys. But um, in most of the places where the military had attempted to intervene, they'd been turned back and even disarmed by the civilian protesters who just said absolutely not you're you will not pass kind of thing and they kind of said all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that happened a few times but it looks yeah, like said, uh, kiev ain't backing down here at all well, even well, as these, uh putin is as you were saying yeah well a lot of these poor guys said all right by the way do you have any bread because we haven't been fed in a while you know so i think when where you did have regular military go in that's when you did see a lot of them turn a lot of them back down but what I think the danger, and, you, and I think you alluded to it, they're not able to count on their military, so they're having to recruit some of these right sector types. They have been training, from what I understand, in military and paramilitary techniques for quite some time. So these guys are quite dangerous. They're quite violent. And these are the kinds of people that they're able to, to recruit to send to the East. And it's just a recipe for disaster because the people in the East feel like they're fighting for their homeland and their way of life. Uh, you know, they feel that uh, the government that went into power in Kiev is not legitimate. It was put together by a coup supported by the West. And so, therefore, if that's if that's accepted, then they have the same right to dissent as the original guys did in Kiev. And the U.S. who supported the guys in Kiev all of a sudden are talking about how you have to crack down and let them know the law. I mean, this is this is a government that is using its own military against its own people. They're they're using uh, helicopter gunships to shoot at some of these uh, at, at some of these uh, checkpoints. They're killing people with helicopter ships, with RPGs. This is the kind of thing that the U.S., when it's a government it doesn't like, uses as a pretext for an invasion. You know, you remember Gaddafi is killing his own people, but somehow it's okay when when the people that the U.S. wants killed are getting killed. That's yeah. that that sounds a bit extreme, but hey, we else? saw it in Egypt last summer, where you know. Uh, uh, Morsi, nobody better uh, get hurt under Morsi, but Al Sisi, Field Marshal Sisi, can kill whoever he wants. Yeah, what it was well over a thousand, wasn't yeah. it? Now there's another thousand sentenced to death. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not controversial, honestly, as, as horrible as it sounds. The facts of the matter are pretty clear there. Um, you know, as far as, uh, 
you know, what human rights means doing what you're told by the USA. But now, so two things in very, very short order to discuss uh, left here, which is, can, do you think that the Americans and their, um, their buddies in Kiev can make this bad enough that they really do provoke a Russian invasion? Or how, how likely do you think that is, that, that Putin ever would actually go ahead and invade eastern Ukraine? you got to admit, it'd be nice to control Odessa, whatever empire you're the head of, right? And so there's that. And then the other thing is about just the larger context of creating a new Cold War at all costs, almost, it seems like, is the real agenda. And you have virtually no time to answer both of those. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I saw an article the other day that uh, Lockheed Martin is thrilled by what's happening in the region, and they're rolling out a bunch of new products to sell to these countries. So that tells you a lot. Uh, can can they provoke a Russian reaction? I think it's I think it's possible, but I don't think Russia wants East Ukraine. They want them as a trading partner, but they don't want to own it. The place is a mess. Who would want it? It's broken. And right. I think Putin understands that. The third thing, Odessa, if you if you know, is the home to one of the largest, if not the largest, Jewish community in Russia. And I think they've got to be scared crapless over what's happening with these right sector thugs coming in. So I think if you see these guys doing something in that respect, I think you, you might you might see Russia getting getting a little bit more upset. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who's supposed to come down and make the most powerful people in the world cool it. They're the they're the highest ranking leaders Earth has, the American and the Russian presidents. So let's hope they can figure this out. Thank you so much for your time and your information, Dan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. That's Dan McAdams, everybody. RonPaulInstitute.org. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Edited by libertarian purist Sheldon Richmond, the Future of Freedom brings you the best of our movement. Featuring articles by Richmond, Jacob Hornberger, James Bovard, and many more, the Future of Freedom stands for peace and liberty and against our criminal world empire and Leviathan state. Subscribe today. It's just $25 per year for the back pocket size print edition, $15 per year to read it online. That's the Future of Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. Peace and freedom. Thank you. Phone records, financial and location data, PRISM, Tempora, X-Keyscore, Boundless Informant. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for OffNow.org. Now, here's the deal. Due to the Snowden revelations, we have a great opportunity for a short period of time to get some real rollback of the national surveillance state. Now, they're already trying to tire us by introducing fake reforms in the Congress. And the courts, they betrayed their sworn oaths to the Constitution and Bill of Rights again and again and can in no way be trusted to stop the abuses for us. We've got to do it ourselves. How? We nullify it at the state level. It's still not easy, but the Off Now project of the 10th Amendment Center has gotten off to a great start. I mean it. There's real reason to be optimistic here. They've gotten their model legislation introduced all over the place, in state after state. I've lost count, more than a dozen. You're always wondering, yeah, but what can we do? Here's something, something important, something that can work if we do the work. Get started cutting off the NSA support in your state. Go to offnow.org. You hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. The military industrial complex. The disastrous rise of misplaced power. Hey, Oscar exists. Horton here. I'd like for you to read this book, The War State by Michael Swanson. America's always gone to war a lot, though in older times it would disarm for a bit between each one. But in World War II, the U.S. built a military and intelligence apparatus so large it ended up reducing the former constitutional government to an almost ceremonial role and converting our economy into an engine of destruction. In the war state, Michael Swanson does a great job telling the sordid history of the rise of this national security state, relying on important first-hand source material, but writing for you and me. Find out how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all alternately empowered and fought to control this imperial beast, and how the USA has gotten to where it is today. Corrupt, bankrupt, soaked in blood, despised by the world. The War State by Michael Swanson. Available at Amazon.com and at Audible.com. Or just click the logo in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org. We should take nothing for granted. 